Thank you. Thank you. Quite an introduction. Quite a class. Wow. That's great. Governor, welcome to the GSB. Thank you. Um, welcome to the view from the top. We're excited to have you here because you've managed to be at the top of, I think, at last count, f at least four organizations. And so we want to talk about your professional success and, and management skills. But um, one thing the dean mentioned, which I think is particularly important, is your commitment to personal success, your family, your community, your faith. And I want to start by an anecdote, uh, which is actually the first time we met. Uh, and I haven't told you the story, though you know I grew up in your hometown for some time. And that's 21 years ago. You invited a bunch of Boy Scouts over to your house when I was nine years old to have a... Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's good. We're still cleaning up that mess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you, you invited a bunch of us over to your house. I think it was about 30 boys. And we were there on a Saturday or Sunday. And you spent the day with us all day, grilling burgers. It was a pool party. And I'm struck by two things as I remember that story. One is that there aren't very many parties I remember from being nine years old. So you clearly know how to throw <laughs> yeah. a very good party. Serving beer to kids is always a big yeah, deal. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, the, the second is that, you know, on reflecting on this story, I realized that this was roughly around the time you were running Bain Capital and about to embark on a Senate campaign. And that really struck me. There are, the, the press is filled with stories when you were leading major organizations but still found time for these kind of examples. And the word having it all gets thrown around a lot, but you have sort of managed to have it all. You have a, a great career, you have a great family, you're committed to your community. I want to know how you've managed to, to strike that balance and have it all. Um, I, I don't know that I've, I've spent a lot of time um, analyzing uh, how you balance your life. At one point, I remember feeling that I wasn't doing as much as I should be doing in my home with my kids. Also feeling I wasn't doing as much as I should be doing at work. Um, and, and also feeling I wasn't doing as much as I, I should at church in my assignment there. And then realizing that meant things were pretty well in balance. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and there may be, it's humorous perhaps, but there's some truth to that, which is if you're spending all of your time in, in one aspect of your life and not devoting it to other things that are important to you, then obviously things are out of whack. Um, I, a couple of things I backed into. Uh, you're in the uh, joint program, business law program. Uh, I, I came from Brigham Young University to Harvard and was convinced I would flunk out. And because uh, I looked around, I saw all these people who were obviously smarter than me. And, uh, and how was I possibly going to make it in this environment except by just studying like crazy? And so I studied all the time. And if I was not studying, I felt like there's this black cloud hanging over me. I should be studying. I've got to be working because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flunk out. And, and it, was, it was omnipresent. And at some point, I finally said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to do something which, uh, which goes back to biblical times. I'm going to take Sunday off. I'm going to decide I'm not going to study at all on Sunday. And I'm going to devote that day to my family, uh, to worship, and just personal time. And uh, it was amazing what happened when I made that decision. Because then on that Sunday, I didn't feel the black cloud there anymore. It's like, okay, I, I, I can't study today. I don't, don't have to worry about it. And, uh, and the same thing happened as, as I went into my career in the consulting industry. Um, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm just not going to work when I come home at the end of the day it may be a late night, and maybe I get home at 6 or 7 instead. But when I come home, I'm going to close my brief briefcase and not work. And I'm going to devote the time I have at home to my family. And it was wonderful. It was just, it was, it was freeing because I could really focus on the things that I cared most about in life, which, which were my wife and my kids. And uh, now, of course, if there was a big presentation coming up, why I'd, you know, I'd break that rule. But in terms of a, a regular uh, uh, pattern of life, those were a couple things I did. Sunday stayed for me a day of family. Uh, coming home at the end of the day stayed a family time. I traveled a good deal. Of course, was on, I was on the road. I worked like crazy uh, late into the night. But uh, a few of those decisions early on shaped how I spent my time and probably helped me uh, balance my life to, towards those things that mattered most to me. 
so how did you get away with that? I mean, there's a lot of people, I mean, all of us come from these, you know, careers or going into these careers where if you say, I'm going to go home at six o'clock, I'm sorry, that, you know, that's not always met with a lot of positive receptivity. Yeah, no, I, I and, and I may have misspoken there. Uh, some nights I might have been able to get home at seven. Um, or take Sunday uh, off. Uh, and, exactly. uh, but, but I, uh, but I found if you take a block of time off for yourself, you may well be more productive than if you don't. And, and that may not be true depending on the organization you go to. But I remember when I was talking to Bill Bain about joining Bain and Company, I said, look, I have to take all day Sunday off. So if there's like a company meeting or if you want to come in for case team meetings on Sunday, I just won't be there. And if that's something that, that the firm can't accept, then I'm probably not the right guy for the firm. And, uh, and I live by that, again, unless it was some kind of a, an unusual experience, some you know, terrible crisis happened, I was going to jump in with both feet like everybody else. But that was the everyday occurrence. And I think it made me more effective and more productive. And I, I had good consulting assignments and got promoted as time went on. So um, I don't think it hurts to have something more in your life than just work. I think, I think having faith or a community that you care about, politics, uh, and children, I think that makes you a more full human being, more able to understand how the world works and how most people think, and may actually make you more effective. And by the way, if it doesn't, and you don't get promoted in the way you wanted to, and you don't make as much money as you wanted to, so what? Li life is not about getting promoted and money. If that's how you measure your life, I got some bad news. There's serendipity in the world. Bad things happen in business, in the economy. You can't be guaranteed you're going to get promoted and make a lot of money. But if you measure yourself by the things that count most to you, your relationship with your spouse, your friendships, your children, your family, those things you can succeed at, whether or not the world goes to hell in a handbasket. So, um, uh, you know, I think you lay out how you want to live your life, and, and, uh, and you do that, you can have success regardless of what happens in the world around you. You, you mentioned your time at Harvard and how this kind of came to you then, um, this, this need to create some sectors in your life. One of the other decisions you made at Harvard was you're graduating with a JD MBA. You decided to go into management consulting. I'm curious for all of us making these kind of choices today, if you had similar interests and were here where, where we are today, would you make the same decision to go to management consulting? And I, I asked that as a JD MBA yeah, yeah. Go, going yeah. into management consulting, oh, oh, so yeah. I really... I hope the answer is yes. My condolences, yeah. yeah, yeah no, yeah, thank yeah. you. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, my path um, was very different than the success books suggested. I mean, there were books out there that said, uh, you know, you ought to have a clear goal in mind and think about that goal. And, and I grew up in Detroit. My dad was a car company CEO. And I fully anticipated to go work for a car, an automobile company. That's what I wanted to do. And so after my first year in the JDMPA program, I went to work at Chrysler Corporation and thinking that's where I was going to go. And I hated it. I was so deep in the organization. And of course, the people, I mean, my boss's boss's boss had never met the CEO and never would. And, uh, and decisions being made that would affect the success of that company, I'd never have any impact on unless I was there 50 or some odd years. And I thought, boy, this is just not at all like I imagined it. And, uh, and so I came back in the second year and uh, got a job, I think it was my second uh, year uh, in the program, I got a job with the Boston Consulting Group uh, for a summer job. And it was fascinating, and it was exciting, and I loved it. And, and so I, it was not a great analysis I did to say this is the right next step for my career. I just enjoyed it. I mean, I, I have, uh, my path in life has primarily been focused on doing things I thought were fun and, and enjoyable. Um, and, and so, uh, that was fun. I mean, my, my undergraduate major was English. I was said, why would you go into English? What, I mean, there's no future, right? As an English major, what are you going to do, all right? And, and, but I liked reading and I liked writing. So I, went, I, I took English as my major. And then coming out of uh, business school and law school, um, I went into consulting because I enjoyed it. Uh, not because that's where I thought I'd spend my life. I expected that I'd be there for two or three years, like most people do, and then get a job in a um, in a line corporation of some kind mm -hmm. and, and, and perhaps move up uh, more aggressively by having started in consulting. I loved consulting uh, because I am I'm oriented towards solving problems. I like analysis and data and problem solving and writing and writing presentations. That's what I like to do. That's what took me there. And so 
uh, I, I, would, I would go to those, uh, I would follow the career path that you enjoy most as opposed to trying to follow a career path that you think will, will lead to uh, the highest income or the, the quick, quickest promotion. Do what you enjoy and, uh, and then your life uh, will be enjoyable and fulfilling. So one other thing you, uh, you, you are known for is parachuting into very troubled environments. Um, you went from Bain Cap to, back to Bain Consulting to turn that around. You went from Bain Cap to the Olympics to turn that around. And then you parachuted into my home state of Massachusetts and helped turn that around as well. What, what led you to make those decisions? What were you looking at to make those kind of like pretty risky bets? Um, yeah, I, I don't know that I have jumped into troubled situations because I enjoy troubled situations. I, I, <laughs> I, uh, but, but it is a sense of obligation. And, and maybe it's my upbringing or my faith uh, or I say upbringing, my parents. My, my dad had this sense of obligation to the country. And my dad was born in Mexico of American parents living there. Um, uh, there was a revolution at the time, came back to the United States, lived in public housing, got public assistance, and, uh, uh, and grew up poor, very poor, and had a, a, perhaps as a result of that upbringing and the opportunity in his life uh, that, that developed over time, had a great sense of obligation to America and to the community. And so whenever he felt that there was a need that wasn't being met, he volunteered and jumped in. And, and somehow uh, I felt the same way. So in the, the first step, you mentioned going from Bain Capital, which was highly successful and, and growing like crazy, and Bain Consulting was in trouble. And it was in trouble because of financial steps that had been taken by the founders. Uh, and it looked like it might disappear altogether. And I was asked by the partners of the consulting firm if I would leave Bain Capital for a couple of years and come back and run the consulting firm. And I felt like, how, how could I say no? There were a thousand people who were working at Bain Consulting at that point, and I figured that there was a very high risk it wouldn't make it. I had the particular skills that were most needed at that point, financial skills, because they needed a financial re-engineering, as well as some leadership skills. And so I came back to the consulting firm. The Olympics, why go to the Olympics? I mean, I, I pointed this out before. There was some irony that a person of such limited athletic talent would be running. <laughs> Running the, I mean, I didn't even let her in a sport in high school, but I'd be, I'd be running the premier uh, sporting event in the world. But I, I, uh, and I, I was not a big fan of the Olympics. When I heard that Utah won the games, it's like, yeah, you know, so what? Who cares whether, uh, <laughs> I, and, and, uh, but then when I got asked to take a close look at it, when it was in trouble, a few things weighed in my mind. One was that this was the community my parents had been raised in. And, and it was going to be tarnished by a potential scandal. Number two, I began to recognize that the Olympics is one of the few remaining places in the world where, where young people get to see day in and day out the great qualities of the human spirit, from uh, uh, hard work and dedication to patriotism, to teamwork, to passion, to to determination. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. We watch the Olympics not because we're enthralled with bobsled, you know, or ski jumping, uh, but instead because we see these young people from around the world uh, in, in a crucible of stress uh, rising above it all, and great things are, are, are viewed. And so I thought it's important these games go on, and I have the particular skill set that's probably needed at a time like this to get the games back on track. So came, and the same thing running for governor. My, we had a Republican governor at the time I was considering coming back after the Olympics and running for governor, but the approval rating of a Republican governor was 13%. And, uh, uh, and a number of Republican leaders said, we really would really appreciate you coming back and, and applying what you've learned in your prior experiences to help our state turn around. We got this massive, massive deficit. Uh, and uh, a lot of people are going to lose jobs. We're going to lose our economic edge as a state. Can you come back? And that's what, that's what drew me in. That's, by the way, why I ended up running for president. It was out of a sense of obligation and, and love for the country and a sense that I was in the right place at the right time. I'll, I'll end with one thing. You've heard the quote many times, but my mother asked it or said it all the time. If not now, when? If not here, where? And if not me, who? And, and she said, if, if you're the right person at the right time, how can you possibly walk away?
I'm, I'm interested because clearly your drive comes from this commitment to public service, but you mentioned your father has a great influence on you and you talk about him a lot. And one of the quotes from your, the documentary on you is you talking about him and saying, you know, you always think about dad and how you stand on his shoulders. How could you go from his beginnings to I can run for president? I started off where he ended up. And that, that's a very self-reflective statement that I think is really interesting. And I'm wondering how much of his success pushes you to strive higher, to aim higher, to push yourself more than maybe you would have otherwise. You know, I think some people compete with their dad or their mom because they have a sense that that, that will fulfill who they are or will define them as a success because they beat their dad or they beat their mom. Uh, I'm not in that category. Uh, I, I didn't feel in any way I needed to compete with my dad, um, uh, in part because he wasn't competitive uh, he, uh, with, with family or friends or whatever. He, uh, a guy entirely without guile. Um, that said, uh, what my dad and my mom taught us in our home and the way they lived their life uh, affected the way I developed. And, and led me to have certain skills I probably wouldn't have had without that upbringing and gave me a perspective on life I probably wouldn't have had without being raised in their home. Um, I, I was young, lucky, lucky to be the youngest in the family, and, and I was six years younger than my next oldest sibling. And the result of that was that I was kind of home with my parents for the last six years after my brother went up to school, and so dad could take me to work with him. And, and I would watch my dad, first when I was younger at American Motors, uh, interacting with executives there. Then I saw him as governor and would go to meetings and watch him, my summer jobs or working in the governor's office, signing his name, by the way, on, on, <laughs> on notary certificates, all right? It's very strange that I authorize people's signatures with my dad's false signature, but nonetheless, I got to watch how my dad interacted with people not recognizing that I was really learning from that experience. And so, uh, yeah, my, my dad and, and, and to a great extent also my mom and the commitment they made to family and church and community uh, shaped what I felt was right about how I should live my life. I want to turn to leadership and management and talk about some of the success stories you've had, of which there are many. I'm curious, when you go, you, you've led multiple different types of organizations, private sector, public sector, nonprofit. When you go into any of these situations, are there any leadership or management principles you take with you no matter where you go that you found successful? You know, um, and I mentioned this to you, Ryan, before uh, we came in here, and that is I, I was uh, one day sitting with a, uh, the chief financial officer of my state who was someone I'd hired from Bain Capital, and before that he'd worked at Bain, and I, at Bain Consulting, so I knew him well. Eric Chris is his name, and uh, a nephew of Milton Friedman, by the way. But Eric said to me, Mitt, there are two types of leaders. One is the kind of leader that knows the particular techniques and skills they use in leading, and the other is someone who has no clue why they're a leader. You're in the latter group. <laughs> so I'm not sure I'm, I'm uh, going to be able to, to help you with this, uh, with this question, but there are... There, there's no question in my mind, but the things that, that allowed me to be effective in consulting and then in helping form a private equity firm and venture capital firm and then in the Olympics and then in the state, that, that those kinds of, of attributes passed from one, uh, one sphere to the next. Um, I, I don't know what they all are. W one is, I believe, having a clear vision of where you want to go and, and being able to articulate that to yourself perhaps writing it down. I tend to, I take out the, the notes section of my iPad and, and we'll, we'll write down what it is I want to accomplish and think about precisely what I hope to accomplish with a particular assignment, so I'll write that down. Uh, so having a clear objective, I think, is important. Number two, uh, I think it's important to know what your values are. I didn't ever write that down, I just knew what they were. But for me, people and, and associations with other people and friendships with people, were more important than, than um, uh, any other aspect of what an enterprise might be doing. More important than profit, more important than gaining market share, more important than promotion, what, what were the feelings I had for other people and they had for me. And so I have, I, I don't try and treat people with respect. I do treat people with respect because I respect people. It's not that I say to myself, to be an effective leader, I have to be respectful of people. No, I, I, I mean, I'm respectful of people. Um, because I re respect other human beings as being uh, sons and daughters of God and, and equal in all respects to me. 
so that, that is, I think that's just part of kind of, I mean, again, I get that from my parents. That's just part of who you are or who you aren't, as the case may be. I don't think you can fake that. Um, and uh, uh, and I'll mention one other thing, and then you can, you can come back to it. I like, uh, or you can push me further if you'd like. <laughs> um, as a management style, I like extensive participation. I like a lot of give and take. Um, I remember on one occasion, um, the chief of staff, uh, while I was serving as governor, came in and she said, look, we've had this tough decision to make about whether to spend, I can't remember how many hundreds of millions of dollars putting in this new subway line. And, uh, and, and she said, I'm going to bring in the cabinet members. We all agree that we should do it. All of us have met. We've gone through the numbers and, and the pros and cons, and we all agree we should do it. And they all sat there. And I said, does anyone here disagree with this decision? And they said, no, we're all on board. And I said that I can't possibly go ahead. They said, what do you mean? I said, well, I have to have someone here who disagrees. We've got to have someone who can make an argument for why it's a bad decision. P please go back and find, if you have to, someone on the other side of the aisle, in the Senate or the House, or someone who really disagrees with this, and then let's take it apart once we can have that kind of debate. I love that kind of exchange and debate. And, and uh, uh, not because, uh, you know, I think I'm the judge who can always pick out the, the right answer, but because I enjoy the give and take and the mental exchange. And I find when you have that kind of exchange, oftentimes I end up being wrong. Uh, oftentimes others are wrong, but we learn from it. And I'm entirely non-defensive about whether my answer, or the, the preconceived notion I came in with was right or not. I only care about getting the right answer. And if, the, if as a group we can come up with the right answer, I don't care whose idea it was. It's like, yeah, let's, let, you know, it's the fun and the engagement of drawing on people and their experience that I, that I find uh, uh, compelling. And I'll mention one more thing, and that is um, uh, I, I used to think I should spend my time as a leader working with people to help them overcome their weaknesses. And then I realized that's a waste of time because by and large people don't overcome their weaknesses. Instead, I found that my job was to help people take advantage of their strengths. And if they had weaknesses, to find ways to, to accommodate that by bringing in other people who had the strengths where they had weaknesses or where I had weaknesses. And I do, by the way. And, and by the way, I've tended to bring in people who, who can complement my own weaknesses. And, uh, and so at Bain Capital, for instance, I, we're a, a very different group of people. It's not the, 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 this, the 18 partners that were there when I left. Now there are over 100. But the 18 partners who were there had very different personalities and skills in part because I saw my job as not trying to make them all the same, but instead taking advantage of the particular skills people had and encouraging those things and filling in the, the blank spots or the flat spots where, where they may not, been, may not have been quite as effective. Your most recent management challenge was your presidential organization. And I'm curious. You may have heard I didn't win. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I did hear that. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And, and, and that's what I actually want to ask about is when you look back at managing that organization, I know everyone can play Monday morning quarterback in politics, but when you look back at managing that organization, what was different about managing a presidential campaign and, and maybe what would you have done differently if you, if you looked at it from a management standpoint again? Um, well, a candidate is by and large not the manager of the campaign. And, and, um, uh, and that is brought home to you day in and day out by the people who are managing the campaign. Um, and, and, uh, and so I, you know, I, I have run for office before. I worked on my mother's campaign for US Senate. I worked on my father's campaigns. My father ran for governor three times, was elected three times. He ran for president, was not elected. But I worked on my dad's campaigns, my mother's campaign, and the candidate is really out there speaking. The candidate is out, is out doing the, the job of connecting with people and, and uh, uh, and, and taking the message to the, uh, to the voting public. The people running the campaign, you choose, like you would if you were the, uh, the chairman of the board, and you choose someone to be the chief executive officer or the chief operating officer, and you have both in a campaign. You have a CEO and a COO in a well-run campaign. And so I was not the CEO or the COO of my campaign. I was probably more like the chairman of the, of the campaign. And, uh, and key strategic decisions I insisted on being a part of. And, and managed in the way that, that uh, I've just described. We would have probably the eight or 10 top um, people in the campaign come together and debate major issues. So in a presidential campaign, was I gonna play in Iowa? 
This is in 2012. I'd played in 2008 and, uh, and found Iowa to, be, Iowa to be expensive and a good start, but not sufficient. Was I going to play in Iowa, or was it hopeless, and should I just go directly to, to New Hampshire? And we debated that at great length and, uh, and talked about a strategy to go forward and, and, and selected a strategy which worked very well. Winning the nomination, by the way, is not easy. Uh, you know, a after it's over, it all looks very easy. Oh, you were obviously going to get the nomination. Oh, yeah, I mean, I was behind uh, Rick Santorum in the last three states, I believe, Iowa, uh, I don't mean Iowa, Illinois, uh, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, also Ohio. Uh, I think I was be behind five or ten points with only days to go before the, uh, uh, the primary. And so it, it is tough to do that, and I think we did pretty, pretty well. I think in the general election, uh, we faced some real challenges and made some big mistakes. And, and, but as I look back at the, at the process that we pursued, I'm, I'm pleased with the process and pleased with the people. We had a really good team of people, very committed. And one of the things I liked about it, there was not the kind of politics inside the organization you sometimes see. People, you know, backstabbing and trying to claim credit for good things. And, um, you know, people had strengths and weaknesses. Each of our team members had, like myself, had real weaknesses. But we worked well, uh, by and large, and, and got a lot of things right and some things wrong. You mentioned things wrong. Um, one of the big challenges that a Republican candidate has is that, that minority voters tend not to vote extensively in Republican primaries or participate in Republican caucuses. They tend to vote in Democratic primaries and Democratic caucuses. So if you're Jeb Bush right now or Chris Christie or Marco Rubio or Scott Walker, and you want to get the nomination, you're going to be going to the people who vote in your primaries and in your caucuses, which will by and large not be minority voters. So for the next year, you're going to watch the candidates on my side of the aisle spend all their time with the white population, and typically not at colleges either. And then when they get the nomination, when someone finally becomes the nominee, they run to the minority community and say, give me your vote, and they say, where have you been? All right? And that was a mistake I made which is I was so anxious to get the nomination, I didn't spend as much time as I should have taking my message to minority voters, fighting on minority, or in this case, Hispanic t uh, TV and radio airwaves, getting my message across, even though it wouldn't help me in the primary necessarily, it certainly was essential in the general. And uh, I think that was something we missed in our strategy sessions. And uh, in part because we looked at what had happened in the past. We said we had to target independent voters. We went after independents. I won independent voters. Won them in, uh, in, in Ohio, among other states. We said, hey, if you got the independent vote in Ohio, you're going to win. No, they're not. <laughs> we needed a much better showing among minority voters, and that's a place we really messed up. And you know, So I go back and say, would I have changed the team? I, I, I like the team. I, I was proud of the team we had and the way we worked together. But do we make a mistake in strategy? Sure, th that among others. Moving to the idea of running for office, uh, people in the room have come up to me and said they want to pursue a career in business like you and then run for office like you. I'm curious, if you were to give advice today to someone like that, would you follow your father's advice, which was you know, find a career, find a reason not to run, and then run later on when you don't have so much at stake? Or would it be something different in today's age? Um, I'm afraid I'm, I'm prisoner of my dad's advice, um, <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell you why. My dad's advice was, uh, because my dad ran for governor when he was 56 years old. He'd been head of a car company. Um, he, uh, he felt that his state was circling the drain, the state of Michigan. He saw that, that automobile jobs were leaving uh, his state, going to other states and, and other countries, and felt that he had to try and uh, uh, turn things around. Uh, he felt that race relations in the state were uh, were uh, awful. Civil rights had not been advanced as they should. That the schools in the city of Detroit were were uh, just a tragedy, and so he got involved and ran for governor. Uh, uh, I got involved in his campaigns. I found politics very exciting, and he said to me, as also to my sisters and brother, he said, "You know, I wouldn't get involved in politics until your kids are raised, uh, and if and only if you're financially independent." And it's like, wow. That, that's never going to happen, I thought. Uh, I, mean, I mean, you know, working in, in consulting is great, but it's not going to make you financially independent. Um, uh, uh, and so I never imagined I'd get involved in politics. And, uh, and what happened was starting Bain Capital and then having the stock market take off. And if you're leveraged and the stock market goes from 1,000 to 10,000, that's a good thing, all right? And so, 
So suddenly, I beca I, those, those conditions became met. Um, uh, I, uh, <laughs> that's the euphemism of the I'll day. I'll write that down. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I personally, and I don't, I don't think you have to be financially independent to run for office. I, I think you have to be able to, to meet your mortgage without having to win the election, however. And that was what my dad was concerned about. Um, I, I, uh, I think it really helps if people who, who go to work in the state house or go to work in Washington actually have experience in the real economy and in the real world and can take that experience to government, whether that's in teaching or working in the foreign service or, or working uh, in a corporation. Uh, I think it really helps to go there with background and experience that you can share with others. I think that was the concept with the, 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 that the founders had in mind in forming our, our republic. And that is that you'd come from a, a real, I mean, I look at John Adams. I mean, he was a, a farmer in Massachusetts, went to serve, became president, went back home, and, and went back home, became a farmer again. And, and I think that's a better model than what we have right now. And so, you know, my advice would be, uh, yeah, work at a real job, get some experience. And if the window opens, you see an opportunity to serve locally, statewide, nationally, then jump in because good people are needed badly. You, another quote you, you uh, said in your documentary was that the other side often acts like they don't know what it's like to own a business. They don't know what it's like to have everything on the line. And I see that disconnect a lot today, especially with income inequality as a burgeoning issue. In particular, private equity is something that you were tremendously successful in and the campaign um, talked about it in a different way. And a lot of our classmates are going into private equity or going into these business careers that are seen as very prestigious here, but maybe elsewhere are seen differently. I'm wondering what you think about that disconnect and whether there's ways we can bridge that divide or how you think about it now. Um, well, a couple things. Um, one, my, my concern about incomes in America is not so much focused on why some people make so much as opposed to why are so many people making so little? And, and we have large uh, cohorts of people in this country who have not seen rising incomes and, uh, and have not seen them for a long time. Uh, and, and so my concern is how do we get people out of generational poverty? How do we get people out of situational poverty? And how do we get the whole middle class in America as well as lower income folks to see rising incomes again? And that, that for me is the big, is the big issue. Um, I, I don't look at, at Steve Jobs and say, you know, boy, he's a bad person for making all that money. I, I look and say, thank heavens for Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and, and, and Scott McNeely and, and Mark Andreessen. More power to him. But do, be more and more successful. And by the way, if you want to give it all away during your life, that's fine too. Great. But, but uh, so I don't look and say, okay, those, I don't think those people are the problem. I think the problem is how come we're not able to lift more? How come we can't get more people to see rising incomes? And, uh, and, and more prosperity. And there are a lot of reasons for, for that. But, but I happen to believe very uh, fundamentally and profoundly that without question that the best principles for helping people get out of poverty and seeing rising incomes is for, is for us to follow conservative and Republican principles. Now, you might say, well, oh, that's not doesn't make sense. You're just the party of the rich. Let me tell you, friends, the rich will do fine whether Democrats are in power Liberals are in power, conservatives are Republicans. The rich do fine all over the world. The rich do just fine. The people whose lives are affected by politics and leadership are the people in the middle and the people at the bottom end. And the reason I'm a Republican is that I believe the principles that, that my party stands for, or at least that I stand for, that those principles are the best designed to help people see rising incomes again and better jobs for their kids. And the, and the best principles that get people out of poverty. I, I mean, I the, the, don't, I mean, I, and we could have this debate at, at, great, at great length, but I think evidence proves it. Uh, I think logic proves it. That's why I'm a Republican. That's why I ran for office, is that I want to help people in the middle and in the bottom see rising incomes. And, and I believe that if you're successful in your enterprise, you're going into business, more power to you. Go out there, be successful, build a business, work in a business that's already there, make it better. The better an enterprise does, the more profit it makes, the more you can invest. The more you invest, the more you can grow. The more you grow, the more people you can hire. The more people that are being hired, the more wages will go up. Wages go up because there's demand for labor that outstrips the supply of labor. That's how they go up. 
And so, I, yeah, I want you to succeed. I mean, I look at you, and, and it, when you're all highly successful business people, as you hope you will be, I mean, I won't look at you and say, there's the enemy. I'll say, there's my friends. I love you, all right? I appreciate what you're doing. I want to see you successful. And I want to see, as you're successful, I want you to, to, to recognize that your success is contributing to the success of our country and to those people who rely on the jobs you'll help create. We only have time for one more question before we're going to move to audience Q&A. Um, and it's a simple question, maybe. It's just, what does the future hold for you? You're boxing Evander Holyfield in yep, the near yep, future, which yep. is a risky, I can say is a risky decision to me. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, you know. The term pulling his punches uh, comes to mind, yeah. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm curious, you know, what, what you want to do next, given all you've accomplished. Uh, well, you know, I, I would... I continue, I continue to be motivated by the same things that got me into uh, presidential politics in the first place. And so I will work for individuals who I believe will get America on the right track to once again create more jobs than we have supply of labor, to see rising incomes again. That means better schools, it means better innovation, it means making America the most attractive place for entrepreneurs and innovators and businesses of all kinds. Uh, it also means an entirely different foreign policy. I happen to think that the foreign policy of the last six or seven years has been uh, a disaster, uh, and the globe is feeling it. Uh, so I want to change direction for our country in, in a way that I think would be more productive for the safety of the world and the well-being of the world, for the preservation of liberty, and for rising prosperity for all Americans. So that, how, how do I do that? By campaigning and raising money for Senate and congressional seats at the, at the national level, uh, by helping Republican candidates for president. Uh, I'd help the Democrat candidates, but they, they're not asking for my advice at this point. <laughs> uh, and there's only one, really, at this stage. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, but I, you know, I speak regularly with, uh, with people who are running for office and offer my advice and will continue to do so. And in some, I, mean, I do a lot of fundraisers and, and, and speeches. And by the way, the reason I'm here, during my campaign, I wasn't at college campuses and business school and law schools. I was at Harvard Law School last week, and I was at Duke, and, and uh, I'll be at University of Chicago coming soon. At the end of this week, I'll be at, uh, at, at, in Jacksonville, Florida. I speak to college campuses because I want people to understand that people who are conservative are conservative because we believe the principles of conservatism are best able to help the middle class and the poor. We know how to end poverty, generational poverty, but we're not doing it because there's not a political will for it to happen. But so that, that's what I'm devoted to. Now, at the same time, I'm back in business because I want to make sure that I can provide for myself and my family without drawing down their inheritance. And, uh, and of course, um, every politician who leaves office says I'm going to spend more time with the family. Uh, I actually am. I have 23 grandkids, and I'm spending time with the family and love it. Thank you, Ryan. Great. Well, we're going to move to some Q&A now. And there will be mics on the left and the right side. So raise your hand high if you're interested in asking a question. For those at the top, please continue to tweet your questions. And we're going to start with a question from Twitter. So I'll point to Ninoy over here. Yeah. What worries you most about the US economy? Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that we may be seeing a bubble in, in, uh, in tech stocks and, and that we could have the, a kind of um, a disruptive event that could cause uh, the, the stock market to collapse. And I'm not, I'm not terrified about people losing money in the stock market. I'm terrified about, about going into a, a recession again that would put a lot of people out of work. They, the, obviously, the Fed has used every tool it has to get this economy going. And if we went into a recession at this point, there are not a lot of tools. Uh, I mean, we're already at zero, effectively zero interest rates, so there are not a lot of tools. We've, we're, we're spending massively more than we take in, so we're, we're pursuing a highly stimulative monetary policy and highly stimulative fiscal policy, both. So if we went into recession at this point, that'd be pretty tough. Uh, I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, I think there's some positive uh, elements on the, on the horizon, which uh, one, of course, is very low cost of energy, which, which is stimulative, gives people more money to spend, and, and those things are encouraging. I don't think we're gonna see something of an immediate uh, nature that causes us to fall into recession again. I, I sure hope not, but the rest of the world is a little iffy and it could have an impact on America. Longer term, though, is my, is my concern. Longer term, I see America as, as adopting the policies of Europe. Higher and higher corporate taxes, although Europe is getting away from that. 
I'll say the traditional policies of Europe, higher and higher corporate taxes, higher and higher levels of regulation, uh, higher and higher personal uh, tax uh, uh, burdens, um, uh, schools that are being run uh, more for the interest of the, the unions than they are for the students, uh, permanent intractable poverty, generational poverty is what I'm referring to. Uh, these things uh, uh, give me gr a great deal of concern. Um, I, I'm concerned about America's innovation lead. We, uh, the, the political class doesn't understand we're in competition. The political class thinks like the American business world used to think back in the 1960s, which you didn't worry about your competition, you just tried to get better yourself. And then came along strategy, which was the idea, is it's not just how good I am, but how good I am relative to everybody else I compete with. And right now we're competing. And the political class doesn't understand we're competing with Russia and with China and with the, G the, the jihadists. And, uh, and they've got strategy. They have a strategy. Russia has a strategy. China has a strategy and objectives. The jihadists do. What's America's strategy? What's our global strategy? Where are we headed? What are we trying to accomplish? What are we doing in Latin America? What's our strategy for North Africa, the Middle East? We don't have a strategy. Hillary Clinton said it right. Just deciding not to do dumb things is not a strategy. And, uh, uh, and so, I mean, that, that's what concerns me most about America and about our economy, uh, is that we don't seem to have a strategy about where we're heading. And we're becoming more and more like Europe on a number of dimensions, education, poverty, taxation, regulation, and foreign policy. And that, that gives me concern, and that's why I, I'm as active as I am still politically, though I'm not running for office. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a question over here. Stand up and just introduce yourself, please. Hi. Hi, Governor Romney. Uh, my name is Alex Pearson. I'm a first year. Um, also, like Ryan, I'm from uh, Massachusetts as well. Um, one of the central themes that the GSB and, and from the View from the Top program is the power of authenticity as a tool for effective leadership. We see that in a business, but we see that, I think, less so in political leadership. And so I wanted to see how you balanced being the authentic Mitt Romney versus what you thought the audience or the kind of Republican machine wanted you to be like, or what, what you wanted to say? Yeah, um, you know, one of the great challenges in running for office is that you will be defined by your opposition. Um, and, uh, and, and, and by the way, an attack is, is very difficult to respond to without spending all your time uh, in response. I, I remember the first time I got attacked, and this was when I was running against Ted Kennedy, and, uh, uh, and, and my, you know, I went to my staff and I said, you know, we've got to answer these charges, these attacks. And they said, you know, if you're explaining, you're losing. Uh, the only, that's a little catchphrase in politics. If you're explaining, you're losing. Uh, so you never explain. You never respond to the attacks. You just attack back. And the only thing you can do is attack back just harder. And, and so these campaigns are attack, attack, attack. And by and large, it's very difficult in a campaign to have people get to know who you really are. I mean, in a campaign, you spent more time with me by far, and I mean TV time included. If you take all the time you saw during the 2012 campaign of me and compare it with what we spent in this room, we spent more time now together talking about things that we all care about. Um, we choose candidates based on very little interaction with them. And typically the interaction is watching 30 second ads, which are packaged and very brief and by and large are attacking your opponent, and, and then debates. And that's about it. Uh, some people have noted, you know, Mitt, if you'd have just shown that, that documentary that was done on you, why the, the people would have had a different perspective. It's like, yeah, but who would have watched a documentary, all right? <laughs> Who's going to sit down and watch a one and a half hour movie on someone running for office? I mean, no one's going to do that because you're going to figure rightly it was all, you know, edited for the campaign, by the campaign. And, and uh, so I, I, uh, I don't know how we can do a better job describing and showing who we are. Uh, and and my, my own view was, look, I, was, I served as governor for four years. The positions I had and the postures I took on issues were the same when I was governor as when I was running for president. And uh, uh, hopefully people will get that perspective based on my record. But it's, it's a real challenge. And, and it, in the upcoming election, presuming Hillary Clinton is the nominee on the Democratic side, and she may not be, but I, it looks obviously very good for her now, um, she's pretty well defined in people's minds pro and con. On the Republican side, people aren't as well defined. And so they're going to have a challenge, whoever our nominee is, um, becoming better known in the mind of the public. And the 
goal of the opposition will be to define the Republican in a negative light, in a very negative light. And that's just, that's part of the territory you know getting into a race. It's, uh, it's it, it, uh, I was going to say it's not fun. The truth is it is fun. <laughs> Running for president is really fun. It's like sport for old guys, all right? It's, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, and you come away uh, passionate about a, the country, more optimistic about the country, you meet extraordinary people. It's a wonderful experience. If you get the chance to run for president, do it for sure. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I love the experience, and and you know I I just wish in a campaign you had more time to be seen and known by more people. And I think if people did that, we'd have a better shot of electing people we were happy with after the election. Yeah, thanks. Right. Uh, we have one question over back here. In there. The back. Yes, sir. Hey, my name's Elliot Damashek, and I'm a second year MBA. Was at uh, Bain Consulting beforehand and going back afterwards, so thank you for helping to make that exist. Um, my question is around, you mentioned that your father was helped by public assistance programs a while back, and traditionally the view of the Republican Party is much less favorable towards those types of programs, so I was wondering how your view on that has evolved and how it's shaped by your father's experience. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, there are, I'm going to talk about two groups of, of uh, people in poverty. One I'll call situational poverty. Someone loses a job or, or has a life-changing illness of some kind and the situation means they're now in poverty. Those people typically come out of poverty relatively quickly. When I say relatively quickly, they come out of poverty eventually. And, and uh, programs to help them come out of poverty are extraordinarily helpful and important. And it's, it could be housing, food, training programs, child care, and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and, and we have a good series of, of social uh, uh, help programs for people in that setting. And I'm sure they could get better. Unemployment insurance is another of those. Um, and, and they should be fine-tuned and, and evaluated to see what makes them more effective. But those work well. Where, where Republicans like myself uh, have some angst is, is in our solutions for generational poverty. And that's people who obviously go from generation to generation in poverty and don't ever get out. Back in the 1960s, when I was in high school, Lyndon Johnson declared the war on poverty. We today have record levels of poverty, more than when Johnson was president. About 15% of Americans live in poverty. So, so why didn't it work? And the answer is the programs that were put in place in many respects made it more difficult for people to get out of poverty. I mean, the highest marginal tax rate in America is not the marginal tax rate for people in my tax bracket or yours. The highest marginal tax rate is for the poor. If, if you're on Medicaid, housing vouchers, food st stamps, and so forth, and you start earning money, you're going to lose all sorts of benefits. And the effective marginal tax rate, if you will, benefit tax rate is huge. And so we lock people from, it, into, into staying uh, on government assistance because it would be crazy for them to get off. We make it almost impossible to get married if, if, for a, a poor person. If a young person is pregnant, and, uh, and she decides to marry the father of the child, she's far less likely to qualify for Medicaid, for housing vouchers, for food stamps, and other forms of assistance. The, the, the only likely way that she'll be able to really get the support she needs is if the father provides some of his support that he has, doesn't get married, and she gets Medicaid and so forth, these other programs. And as a result, not surprisingly, huge numbers of people follow that path. There, there was a study done by Brookings Institution some years ago, and, and I, I've got the numbers here directionally right. I'll have to go back and look at the actual numbers, but they're close to these. They said, what, what happens in America if someone graduates from high school, marries before they have their first child, and has ever held a job? And the answer is 3% of those people will fall in poverty. What happens if someone doesn't do any of those three things? 70% of them will be in poverty. It's like, aha. So if you want to make sure we eliminate generational poverty in America, one, you want to make sure there are huge incentives to get people their first job. We don't do that. Two, you want to make sure that schools are safe and teachers are effective so we can get people through high school. We don't do that. And three, you want to make sure that your government programs encourage people to get married as opposed to create disincentives for marriage, which ours do. We are doing exactly the wrong things if we want to get people out of poverty. And yet there doesn't seem to be any real effort in Washington to change that. Uh, so Republicans are saying, 
by the way, when I was governor, I said, look, I want to spend more money on child care and have a greater work requirement to get people out of the home and into, into the workplace. I'm happy to spend more money on assistance, but I want it to help get people out of poverty, not lock them into poverty. So uh, support and, and government assistance to end uh, and alleviate poverty, Republicans are all in favor of, but they want to find things that actually solve the problem as opposed to uh, uh, cause people to live in poverty in a, in a human tragedy that goes on and on and on, generation to generation. Thanks for the question. Um, unfortunately, I, I'm going to have to take the last question here. Boy, I'm uh, wordy, aren't I? We're it's cutting a... you off. Yeah. <laughs> Be worried. No, uh, we, um, we asked a, a question of all of you from the top speakers, and it's uh, one that we have to answer when we apply to the school. And there are obviously a lot of ways you could answer this, so I'm, I'm interested. Uh, but the question is, what matters most to you and why? Um, it's not one thing. Um, and uh, all right. <laughs> So I'm going to give you a longer answer. <laughs> One, another long answer. One, um, uh, I believe in God. Uh, I know some people don't, but many people who don't nonetheless believe in something greater than themselves. I, I believe that, that uh, if you believe in something greater than yourself, that, that your life will be more full and, uh, and productive. So I, I believe in God. And by the way, in believing in God, I believe, therefore, we are all his children. And I believe that God loves all of us. And I believe he loves us uh, as you would love your children. Some are doing naughty things, some are doing nice things, but you love them all. And, uh, and, and I believe that I will be measured and you will be measured based upon what you have done for your fellow uh, children of God. And, uh, and that means your spouse, your children, and your community more broadly. Um, so that's a big part of what's important to me, which are the people around me that I care for. The person I care for most in life is my wife. We met in high school. I love her passionately. She is the most important person in my life. If I could do anything uh, on any day, it would be to be with her. That's what I enjoy most in life. Close thereafter is to be with my kids, my, my boys and their wives, and now 23 grandkids. The, the greatest joy I have in life is being with them, sitting around in the backyard or, or at a beach, just being with my grandkids and family is the greatest source of happiness and the most important thing to me. Coming beyond that is a circle which includes my church, my congregation, the people I know at church, and my sense of service to them. Um, service in the broadest sense, um, giving back in the sense of caring for people around me is, is, um, uh, follows from that belief in something bigger than myself. I, I happen to believe that the currency in life is the people that you love and that care for you, the friends you have. Most of what you've learned here, you'll forget. The people you've met here, you'll remember the rest of your life and, uh, and will form a big part of your, of your wealth. That's your balance sheet when life is over. Who loves you and you love and who are your friends and, and, uh, and how close are they to you? So what's the most important thing to me? My God, my, my wife, my kids, and, uh, and my fellow human beings. And, and I participate and engage with, with, with people at large through campaigns, through speeches, uh, through uh, serving in charities, in all sorts of ways. And, uh, and the, rewards, the rewards that come back are, are rewards in people, in, in friendship, in love. And, uh, and that's what makes the most impact in my life. Thanks, you guys. Congratulations to you and best we of luck. Good to be with Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to Very, very nice to